Lord God, as we continue to worship you through your word, I just pray that your spirit would direct the words from my mouth, that your spirit would direct our hearts and attention. Lord, where my words may lack clarity, I pray that you would bring them clarity. Lord, we give this time to you. We give our hearts and voice and ears to you in worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when you go to the doctor's office and get an exam, and they, they check you all out, and they're poking and prodding, if you go, ouch, during that exam, there's one of two things that has taken place. Either the doctor hasn't been gentle enough, it's been a very rough exam, or he's touched a tender spot. And the tender spot requires some attention, and you go, ouch. I think the same can be said for when a pastor speaks about Christian faith and money within the church. If you go, ouch, during that, one of two things. Either the pastor has been a little bit too rough with the discussion um, and, and the preaching regarding Christian faith and money, or he's touched a tender spot, and you go, ouch. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think for many ministers and myself, I would put up there, there's a reluctance to preach on the topic of Christian faith and money due to a lot of the stereotypes. I think the last time I preached uh, any kind of sermon like this was probably going on three years ago now. But I think part of that stereotype of, oh yes, the church is always looking at money, oh it's all about money, 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 I think that stereotype is something that for many ministers makes it a very reluctant topic to preach on. Yet Jesus spoke at length regarding both money and possessions. The Lord Jesus, in one of his early public sermons, said this, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus spoke at length about money. And yet sometimes the opposite extreme is where Christians go and say, money is bad, money is evil. And they misquote a verse in 1 Timothy and they say, money is the root of all evil. And yet that's not what that text says. In context, that misquoted verse properly reads this way. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmless, harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. See, there is a spiritual side to money. And how we handle our money and possessions is reflective of our spiritual values. Over the next three weeks, this Sunday and the next two Sunday, I want to spend some time looking at God and money. And I want to look at five principles related to God and money. Originally, I had it written down, five principles towards financial peace. But I thought, that just sounds sappy and sounds like an infomercial or something. And yet, at the same time, stress over money is huge, both in homes and individual lives. And so when we do begin to look at God and some of the wisdoms in, in Scripture, when we begin to look at those principles, there is peace that can follow with it. So over the next few weeks, I want to talk about five principles related to God and money. Now, I want to start by saying I'm not a financial advisor, nor am I pretending to be one. I am not going to advise on investments outside of the investment of our lives into that which is the kingdom of God. But I do want to, within my lane, walking in my lane as a pastor, address the spiritual values and biblical wisdom as it relates to money. There are many people that are stressed in their relationships. There are many conflicts in marriage that are related to money, and God is not silent on the topic. 
Also, as we talk about this concept of money, it's not just something about the individual Christian and God, but it's something that churches and church congregations need to consider as well, corporately, as we look at the values for how we manage and how we use the resources that God puts within the local church. Occasionally, I get asked the question by people, so how is the church doing financially? And that's not necessarily a bad question, but a more important question would be, what is the church doing financially? What is the church doing with what God has entrusted it? Ministers seem to talk either too much or too little about money, and often for the wrong reasons. And we forget that how we manage finances and possessions is reflective of our spiritual values and is part of our discipleship, what it is to learn to follow Jesus. And what it is to learn to follow Jesus includes our money. <clears throat> now, before I get into these principles, the first thought I want to deal with is actually not one of the principles, but I want to bring this clarity to begin with. God is not bound by money. God is not bound by money. In fact, one of the teachings we get when we go to the Bible in Luke chapter 9, we hear a familiar story of the feeding of the 5,000. And in the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus is, is ministering to a group of people. The day gets late, and, and the disciples say, you should send these people away. It's getting late. And Jesus looks at them, and he tells his disciples, you feed these people. And they take a look, and they say, what we have, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. In the in, uh, Gospel of John, in a parallel account, in John chapter 6, Jesus actually specifically addresses Philip and said, how are you going to do this? What are, what are you going to do here? And we read that Jesus said this to test Philip because Jesus already knew what he was going to do. God does not need your money. God does not need your money. The church does not need your money. The story of the feeding of the 5,000 challenges the scarcity mindset in believers that think unless we have it like this, then we can't and God's hands are sometime, somehow bound. God is God. God does not need our money. He is not limited by us. He is not limited by our giving or our lack of giving or by any other resources. The scriptures say he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, as Hudson Taylor often quoted. And if God wants to provide, God will provide. But we may miss out on being something that God is inviting us into. And I think that's important to make, make clear I remember I preached on this many years ago in my first church, and after I was done, uh, I had a, an, an older farmer come and visit me the following week, and he was very upset with me. Uh, he was very upset with my sermon because I said that God does not need us. And his belief was God did need him, and God did need what he was giving and what he was doing. That's not the case. God is God. God is God. God is complete in himself. God invites us as part of our relationship with him to be a part of what he is doing around us. And we experience blessing, spiritual and otherwise, as we partner with God in the things that are on God's heart. Our relationship with money and possessions. How we handle the money and possessions that enter into our lives is a reflection of our spiritual values and is an important part of discipleship, learning to love and follow Jesus with all of our lives. So with that, we're going to begin five biblical principles that speak to our spiritual values as they relate to money. We're going to look at the first principle this week, the second principle next week, and then the third week we're going to cover principles three to five. They kind of work together. So the first principle this morning, biblical principle related to God and money that speak of our spiritual values regarding our money and possessions is this. Transfer ownership to God. Transferring ownership of every financial resource and possession to God. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> God's sense of humor, right when you want to emphasize a point, you've got to stop for a drink. 
First principle, transferring ownership to God. Let me say this to you, dear people. You will never have peace with your finances as long as they are yours. If you are a Christian, you will never have peace with your finances until they are given to God. Now, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I understand your skepticism on this. I, I do understand your skepticism on this. But if you're here this morning, if you're not a Christian, what I want you to understand is for, that for Christians who seek to follow Jesus, that seek to live with Jesus as Lord of their lives, out of their love and gratitude for the grace that we have received for the cross, we learn to surrender our lives to Christ. We learn to follow Him with all that we are. And that includes our wallets and our bank account. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, you've heard me quote it many times. And He, being Jesus, died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for Him who for their sake died and was raised again. God blesses us with many resources so that we can enjoy them. We're going to talk a little bit more about that next week. God blesses us with many resources so that we can enjoy them. But as Christians, we need to understand that all of life is given over to God. All of life. Not just a part of it. We may get to use it. We may get to use it. But if God calls upon it, it is His. It is His. Part of our discipleship, a part of following Jesus, is that all of my life is now all for Jesus. The Lord Jesus put it this way, no one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Dear people, as long as you are the owner in your life, you will not have peace as a Christian. You will not have peace. There will be a tension as to whose is this. Spiritually speaking, we describe this as living under the lordship of Jesus Christ, and it touches every area of life. Dear people, you are either the lord of the manor or the steward of the house. You are either the lord of the manor or the manager, the steward of the house on behalf of the owner. Part of the reason that this is so difficult for many Christians today um, is because I think we have been introduced often within the church to a deficient salvation theology. Sometimes within the church, sometimes Christians have experienced the church telling them or calling them to come to Jesus as their Savior. Come and experience Jesus and His saving faith. Come and know the joy of the assurance of salvation and the assurance of heaven. And then later it becomes a bait and switch. The church called you to enjoy the grace of Jesus. Now later we call you to be a disciple, to be a follower of Jesus. That is a deficient salvation theology where Jesus is Savior, but he is not Lord. And Jesus presents us with no such theology in the scriptures. The Lord Jesus looks at you, he looks at me, and he says, come follow me. You remember the occasion, one of the first occasions where he calls his disciples to himself. He showed his ability to provide for their needs. They go out in a boat. They hadn't caught anything all night. They hadn't caught anything all night. And that's when it was time to fish. They were listening to Jesus. And as Jesus was preaching, he finished up and he looked at Peter. He said, go cast the net out. Take your boat back out. I know you're cleaning it up. I know you're putting it away. I know you're getting ready to go to sleep so that you can get up and work again in the evening. I know this isn't the time of day for fishing. But Peter, go and take this net back out there and put it in. And, and, G, and Peter, in his... <sighs> Okay, because you say so, Lord, I will do this. Peter takes the net out, and, and, and the four of them, these four soon-to-be disciples, they put the net out, and there is so much fish, it is the biggest catch in their entire life. They bring it on shore. They're struggling to keep the nets from ripping. They see this miracle of Jesus, and then Jesus tells them, come follow me. And you know what those disciples did that day? The Bible says they left everything. 
and they followed him. They didn't even take the fish that they caught to the fish market. I mean, I'd have been sitting there going, Jesus, that sounds good, but let's, let's maximize our potential here. Let's take this. This is like, this is like we, we got the biggest catch of our life. Let's take this to market first. Jesus looks at them and says, come follow me. And the Bible says they left everything and came and followed him. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus wants you to literally do that in every and all occasions. Sometimes he does. The, the, the question comes down to, am I willing when he calls to leave that behind to follow him? And Jesus showed them that day that it doesn't matter how little they think they have, Jesus is enough and will provide for the needs. We have this deficient salvation theology that sometimes makes Jesus Savior but doesn't make him Lord. Jesus says, follow me. We experience the grace of the cross which is a starting point for spiritual transformation. And as we follow Jesus, our lives change every area of it, including our relationship to money. The first biblical principle when it comes to money and God is this, transfer ownership to God. All of it, all of it belongs to him. You cannot serve two masters. Jesus is Lord or he is not. And you cannot you cannot worship both God and your stuff. That's the principle. Transfer ownership to God. Now, how do I make this principle, this transfer ownership to God, how do I make that principle alive in my life? A tangible way of transferring ownership to God is this. It's what I call first fruits giving. Giving your first fruits to God. Yes, I'm going to talk about giving this morning. Not because God needs it or because the church needs it. Not to fund some manipulative or hypocritical church or minister's excessive lifestyle. We've all seen stories and pitches on that. Giving is about what our hearts need to do with one of the strongest idols of our day that competes for the allegiance of God in our lives. That is why giving is so important in discipleship. I met a man years ago. He was my boss in one of the shops that I worked at. And he told me he was a Christian, but he didn't bother with, with going to church. He didn't bother with being really involved in, in, in Christian life and that. He was very big into a, a, a marketing business campaign and tried to get everybody else involved with it as well. And I remember him telling me, he, he said, um, you know what, I, he's a Christian and he's going to follow God and he wants to do all these things, but first he wants to do this. And once he has the money stuff settled, then he will go on to this. And I remember thinking of the words of Jesus that spoke about the man who had to build more and more barns to put more and more stuff in that uh, he didn't, uh, didn't really have a plan for. And Jesus' words were pretty strong. He says, you fool, your soul will be required of you this evening. Then what will happen to all your stuff? You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve money today and Jesus tomorrow. Jesus says, come follow me. A tangible way of transferring ownership to God is give your first fruits to God. Now, what is this? In the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 34, God says this through Moses to the people of God in the Old Testament. He says, the best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. And what he was saying, the first portion of your income you should bring to the house of the Lord. Now in the Old Testament, this way we often talk about something called the tithe. The tithe, which means a tenth, we read this in Leviticus, that a tithe or a tenth of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. And again in Malachi, we read, well, a man robbed God, yet you robbed me. But you ask, how do we rob you? And God replies in tithes and offerings. In the Old Testament, the part of their giving system was something called a tithe. And it was, it, was, it was the first 10% of everything they made went back to God. 
Now, this thing is off, this tithe business is often misunderstood today. And I know I'm going to have some people that disagree with me, and that's okay. I, I will sit and listen with you. Um, but, but bear with me here. It's often misunderstood because for us as Christians on this side of the cross, on our, for us as Christians in the New Testament, nowhere is the tithe commanded for us today. But there is something we can still learn from it. Nowhere are we told in the New Testament that we are to give a tithe to God. But there is something that we can still learn from. See, this was part of the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. And in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the tithe was God's taxation system for his theocracy, for the theocracy of Israel. When God rescued his people from the promised land and they were out in the middle of, of the land, they're on their way to the promised land, they were just a motley group of slaves. And God gave all kinds of laws and commandments on Mount Sinai. Some of them were laws that related to the character of God and their worship. Some of them were ceremonial laws. Some of them were civil laws about, they didn't know how to be a people. They didn't know how to govern themselves. They were used to being slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And as God set apart his people to be a nation to show the rest of the world what God is like, to be a relate nation that would show the rest of the world what it is to be in relationship with God. Part of the people of God functioning under a theocracy where God was their king was the implementation of a taxation system that included this thing called the tithe. The Old Testament tithe was used for this. It was used to support the Levite priests that ministered in their midst. It was also a social safety net for the poor, the widowed, the orphaned, and the otherwise disadvantaged. We read this, what God says that this tithe was to be used for in Deuteronomy chapter 26. Starts in verse 13, we read this, or 12. When you have finished paying all the tithe of your produce in the third year, which is the year of tithing, they had a year of tithing. They actually had three separate tithes in the Old Testament. When you have finished paying this tithe, sorry, when you have finished paying all the tithe of your produce in the third year, which is the year of tithing, giving it to the Levite, the sonderer, that's the, the, the stranger or the traveler in their midst, the fatherless and the widow, so that they may eat within your towns and be filled. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, and it continues on. The purpose of the tithe, the purpose of the tithe was to support the Levite priests in their midst and to be part of the social safety net for the people of Israel, for the widows, the orphans, the stranger in their midst, those who had need. There are three different tithes given to the Israelites. I would say this, we are not bound by the Old Testament concept of the tithe. And I'm, going to, and I'm going to share why in a minute that I think we can learn something from the tithe, but the tithe has actually caused damage for many believers in their relationship with God and their relationship with money. We are not bound by the Old Testament concept of the tithe. We are not Israel, and we do not relate to God under the terms of the Old Covenant. This changed with Jesus, but there's still something that we can learn from it. First thing I would say this, tithe was first fruit giving. And this is a principle I believe continues to transfer to us today as Christians. First fruit giving is when the first part of our income is given to God for a testimony of his ownership. The first per portion of our income is given to God as a testimony of ownership. Now, the first question that people ask with that is always this question, right? What's the question? How much? How much? How much of my money should I be giving to God? Should I give the tithe? Should I give 10%? How much? And I dislike that question because what that question is really saying is this. What is the minimum amount that I can get away with and God is still happy with me? When you ask the question, how much, you're asking a question of obligation. You're asking a question of legalism. 
How much is asking the question, what's the minimum amount I can get away with and still feel like I am a good Christian? What does God expect of me? What ought I to give? And dear people, in the New Testament on this side of the cross, no amount is ever given to us. Rather, we are called to generosity in response to grace. We read this, and I can go to a number of different passages, but I'm just going to use two. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 8, we read this. Paul is talking, he's, 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 he's actually he's doing a collection that is going to be used for people, for Christians in Jerusalem that were going through a famine. And he says this, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, and his righteousness endures forever. What is Paul saying in there? He gives us an answer to the question of how much. The answer is this, what you decide to give. What have you decided in your heart to give? He said, God loves a cheerful giver. Each one should give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Now we go back a chapter. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and it begins in verse 1, and it goes down to verse 7. Paul again is talking to them. You might see a big heading in your Bible, an encouragement to give generously. He says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in all earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you excel in this act of grace also. And if you have your, an NIV version, it says this, excel in the grace of giving. The New Living Translation, I want you to excel in this gracious act of giving. How much should I be giving? That's the wrong question. That's a question of obligation. The question is, what do you want to give? That is the more revealing question. Because that is the question of, that comes out of grace. When you look at that question, you see something of what is going on in your heart and something of your relationship to both God and money. See, if you get caught up and say, you know, Christians need to be tithing. I need to be tithing. That's what does God expect of me? What am I obligated to do? Then that question is about what do I have to do to keep God off my back? What do I have to do to keep God happy with me? That is not the way we are meant to relate to God. We are meant to relate meant to relate to God in a response of grace and graciousness, which should overwhelm within us an expression of worship. Our giving ought to come out of a hot heart towards God. See, some people tip God for service, and it better be a good service. They give God the leftovers. Once everything else is taken care of, let's see what I got left here. And they tip God for service. Whereas first fruit giving is giving that sets aside something of the first of what you have received as an expression of love and worship and lordship that says it all belongs to God. See, we need to start with God first, and that includes with our money. How do we transfer ownership to God? We need to start with 
first fruit giving. Again, I'll say this, giving is not about what God needs. He's God. It's not about what the church needs or what any other Christian organization needs. Giving is meant to be worship. Giving is meant to be the overflow of a hot heart towards God. We give because we need to surrender to God and our giving becomes a testimony of his ownership of our resources. You see, God will use it. God will use our giving God will use this through his people to meet many of the same similar needs that were part of the Old Testament. God will use it through the church and through other means to fund the ministries of discipleship and worship and meet the practical needs of those who have fallen on hard times. Benevolence, God will use it that way. But the perceived need is not the reason that Christians give. We give to God first because God is first. This is first fruit giving, not what's left over when all the rest is done. Why is the grace of giving part of following Jesus? Because your heart needs to be able to give of what you own so that what you own does not begin to own you. Your heart needs to be able to give of what you own so that what you own does not begin to own you. See, when you worship money, you're not willing to give it up. Do you know what your God is this morning? I know what you'll tell me your God is. You're sitting here in church. That's my God. Your God is the last thing that you will release. Your God, what you truly worship deep in your heart, is the last thing that you would let go of. <clears throat> Again, the question, how do you, how much? You gotta figure that out. Excel in the grace of giving. <clears throat> and I know people don't like that answer. I had somebody, somebody in, uh, in my office this week that asked me a question. I said, no, I'm not answering that for you. You gotta figure that out. I said, no, give me an answer. I want an answer, give me this. I said, no, we want to have something to measure by. God says, what's going on in your heart? What's going on in your heart? Do you overflow with generosity, or are you trying to figure out how you get to hold on to everything? Remember a personal discipleship class that I was, took in Bible college, and uh, the instructor, a pastor of a church, I eventually interned under him. He was, he was doing this class, and they talked about giving. And he asked an interesting question. It's always stuck with me. He said, the question is not how much you give. It's how much it costs you. And I remember him talking about the story of the widow's giving in, uh, in, in the Gospel of Luke. You remember the story of the widows giving? Um, the, the Pharisees, they give out of their abundance, and they give this in, into, the, uh, into the temple. And this widow gives her, her two mites, her, her last, out, out of what was left. I, I, she had nothing. And she gave this. And Jesus it didn't appear to be very good at math. Because what Jesus said is that she gave more than all of the Pharisees did put together. Well, no, they gave more. Quantitatively, they gave more. So what is Jesus talking about? Jesus didn't need the money. God doesn't need the money. Rather, rather, the question becomes, how much did it cost you? See, for some people, the idea of a tithe, that can be an excessive challenge, depending on where you are in life. And for other people, the tithe has put limits on their giving that shouldn't be there. I remember he put it this way. If you're a person who makes $30,000 a year and you gave 10% back to God, then you gave $3,000 and you chose to live off of $27,000. If you are a person that makes $100,000 a year and you gave 10% to God, you gave $10,000 quantitatively, you gave more, but you chose to live off of $90,000. Whose giving costs them more? And that's as Jesus criticized the Pharisees and that that gave out of their abundance. What they gave didn't affect them. 
There was no real sacrifice that was involved in that. This is why I struggle with the 10% number. Because I know some people where they're at in life, it's probably not what they can start with. And other people have simply given that to satisfy a legalistic quota so that they can live far above what they ever should be on what's left over. Now, I'm not saying we can't have nice things. I'm not saying that. We're going to talk a little bit about that last next week. What kinds of things would God have us spend money on? There's a, I'm not saying that that's, that's a, a wrong or bad thing, but it can be. It definitely can be. Because sometimes we make all the plans for ourselves first, and then we consult God with what we might do with what is supposed to be his. How do I transfer ownership to God? Start with first fruit giving. The first thing off of whatever God gives you, give to him. How much? You figure out. Maybe you'll start at 2%. Maybe you'll start at 4%. Maybe you'll start at 14%. Maybe you'll start at 38%. Whatever it is, it's between you and God. Determine in your heart. Don't do it reluctantly. Be cheerful with it. And start somewhere. Start somewhere. And out of what God gives you, determine in your heart the amount and excel in the grace of giving. My prayer has often been, Lord, as, 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 as you bless in my life, I pray that I would become a more generous person towards the things of God and really towards the people around me as well. God, money, and peace. There is a spiritual side to money. How we navigate the material resources that pass through our hands becomes a reflection of the spiritual values we hold and are developing. For Christians, we will not have peace regarding our finances until we begin with the first of our biblical principles with God and money. We will not have peace until we transfer ownership to God. How do we do this? We establish the practice of first foot fruit giving. A predetermined amount given first to God that speaks of his lordship in our lives, that acknowledges his ongoing faithfulness to us, and it is an expression of worship and thanksgiving. Next week, we're going to look at the implications of this. Learning what it is to be a manager and a steward of what is God's rather than seeing ourselves as an owner. And we're going to look at a tool that uh, we ought to be perhaps... Ah, that sentence came out wrong. We're going to look at a tool that we could use uh, to consider how to do that. And then the following week, we're going to look at some wisdom of the Bible as it relates to things such as debt, spending, and saving. The Bible actually has some things to say about that. But for this morning, we can excel in the grace of giving because we live by faith in a gracious God. How much ought to I give is the wrong question. What do I want to give? That's the question that is much more revealing about what's going on in our hearts and our spiritual values. Next question, some people, you're not supposed to introduce a new thought and a conclusion, but I am just real quick here. Where should I be giving? I'm going to talk a little bit more about that next week. My, but my quick answer to that is, wherever God's at work. Where should I be giving? Wherever God's at work. The local church, various ministries, local and abroad, that seek to help people become and grow as followers of Jesus. Look for where there are physical needs that God wants to meet. meet. Sponsor children, food banks, where God wants Christians to serve the world in Jesus' name. Give to those places. As Christians, we do have responsibilities towards our local ministries, the churches that we are a part of. But dear people, don't ever let a church or a pastor prescribe and insist to you how much you should be giving and where you should be giving it, which is usually to them. Don't ever let a church or pastor prescribe those things for you. If you do, that's a red flag. That's a red flag. That's not about teaching you to be a follower of Jesus with your money. That's about manipul manipulating you for faulty religious reasons. Where should I be giving? Wherever God's at work, look around. 
find out what matters to God and what's on his heart and where God is at work and then participate with that in your giving. We give as a part of our worship so that what we own or think we own doesn't begin to own us. Dear people, what does your relationship with money and stuff reveal about your spiritual values this morning? That's what I invite you to consider. What does your relationship with money and stuff reveal about your spiritual values this morning? Jesus said, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. For the pagans run after these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The way we relate to our money and possessions will reflect on the way we relate to God and the spiritual values he is seeking to instill within us. Dear people, what will be what will being a follower of Jesus when it comes to the material resources God has put in your life, what will be a, being a follower of Jesus look like in this area for you? Amen.